Good morning, and welcome to this service. I welcome both the people here in the room and folks who are watching us virtually on Facebook Live or on YouTube. And Kathy, thanks for that lovely prelude. I am the Reverend Bill Ingraham, and I have the distinct honor of serving this church as senior pastor, and I'm grateful to get to do that with you as part of the work that I do. So just a few announcements today. Um, there is not a deacons meeting this week. They've moved that to the end of the month. The 23rd um, is the, the Monday, the 23rd of August is when the deacons are going to have their August meeting, which is traditionally held at the Riedel's Lake House on Island Pond Lake. And so if you need any information about that, you can speak with Sue. But you have a couple of weeks before you need to do that. Um, the, both the stewardship committee and the outreach committee are not meeting this month. So there are absolutely no meetings, no official scheduled committee board or otherwise group meetings this week. I know that makes you all very sad. Um, after service today, we will be dedicating a memorial garden out in front of our church. It's a small little memorial garden for um, unknown soldiers and people missing in action. It's right below our sign, um, very subtle, little garden on our front property and so when that's over we invite everyone who's here um, we'll go out through the crossroads and out to the front and have that dedication um, those are the announcements that I have for today I am glad to see our worship leader has made it inside I was wondering if I was going to be saying the prayer let me talk a little bit about the flowers that are up front here um, these were Flowers for the funeral of Nancy Apkarian. That funeral service was on Friday. Nancy and her husband Dave um, were members of this church and very active. Dave's parents before him, they used to sit back in that corner of the church. Um, Nancy was only in her upper mid-60s um, and had breast cancer. And um, after struggling with that for many years, she died at the end of July. And so we were honored to get to hold that service here in our church. Um, we'll hold that family in our prayers. And I had meant to mention um, who I call my sister, um, Benji Johnson, one of my closest, most dear um, loved ones in all the world, a part of the large Filipino family that in love has named me as their own. They say I'm the tall, pasty, white son they never had. Um, well, my sister Benji developed very rapid breast cancer, ductal breast cancer, and so she had double mastectomy last Thursday. And as they say it, um, everything went according to plan, which is a way of putting positive, the surgery has gone well, but we don't know yet the results of the surgery. And so I ask your prayers for Benji and all of her family. Um, and for me, Thursday was a very long and hard day um, as I was waiting here while she was in surgery for nine and a half hours in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Those are the joys and concerns that I have listed today. I know there are always others. Um, I can think, yeah, Christine, why don't you name your joy and then I'll repeat it on the microphone. Yeah, so... Um, Christine is here with both of her amazing children. Matt is off to the Marine Corps tomorrow. And so we celebrate that one of his last stops on his tour of goodbye to Methuen is to be here at church with us. Um, and I have a sense that a lot of that is to make his mother happy, which is a good thing, Matt. Thank you for doing that. Um, those are the joys and concerns that we have listed today. We hold others in our hearts, people who are traveling, people who are um, sick, facing surgery, recovering from surgery, surgery living with long-term um, disabilities or other um, medical conditions. We also, of course, are very much aware of recent increases in the coronavirus, especially in areas where vaccinations are low. Um, it is remarkable that some school districts in some areas are considering having to sue their state governments in order to have permission to have masks worn in school. Um, it's just a remarkable time in our country as we have politicized a pandemic that has killed more than 660,000 people in our country alone. So I continue to pray for us to listen to each other, to respect one another, to care for each other, but also to find ways of making each other safe. 
Those are the joys and concerns for today. We will now um, officially begin our service as we pray together the morning prayer. There were 72,000 reasons why I was a minute late, because that's how many MIAs from World War II are still out there somewhere, including church member George Bacatel, that we will celebrate after worship today. Doesn't mean we stopped looking, just mean we hadn't found them yet. Good morning. Please join me in the morning prayer. Our gracious, heavenly God, we gather now in Christ's name, grateful for this opportunity to know your presence. Stir our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Teach us the ways of love and help us to live them. Show us the ways of mercy and lead us in expressing them. Make us anew after Christ's example that we might walk in his ways and be your faithful, loving people. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'll sit down here in the middle of these pretty flowers um, and lead us in a children's time. Um, it's peculiar, I know for folks on home, maybe for folks in the room, it may seem peculiar that week after week we have children's time in church when children can't be in church right now because we're not having unvaccinated people and it's a really um, hard reality as we're continuing to live into the process of um, regathering as a congregation and opening up again step by step in stages that we feel like are safe and we can help protect everybody who comes. So I miss having kids each and every Sunday. And I don't know how many kids are watching this service right now. Early on, we were all watching at the same time. I know when I would be in the office in the early days of the pandemic and we would have hundreds and hundreds of people view, and most of them viewing right at the same time we were online. And so I would hear and even get artwork from kids that were watching the service um, interacting. And now I know more and more people watch our service later in the week, the people that tune in on Facebook or um, YouTube, and that doesn't bother me at all. So we'll have 20 to 30 here in worship on a Sunday morning. And on Sunday morning online, we might have 20 or 30, but by the end of the week, we might have 400, 500, 600. So I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> if that many people want to watch our service at any old time, that's great by me. I am grateful 
that we can worship together in whatever form and however time works that out for us. So for children today, imagining that children have come up the aisles clomping and making noise and being kind of encouraged by their parents to come on up and sitting around here. Today it would be a little crowded because of these flowers in the way. In fact, if children were coming, I probably would have put the flowers further back than they are because a lot of the kids like to sit on the step. Well, I want to ask you, have you ever made something and then made it again differently? Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? Make something and then make it again differently. But let me talk about what that might be, how that might be. So I can remember making things with um, clay when I was a kid, whether it was Play-Doh that was bought or um, a kind of molding clay that my mom would make or a clay that was dug out of the ground that was used by like potters and ceramics makers. And so you take the clay and you form something out of it. Make you, maybe you make a little bowl or maybe you make a bird, or maybe you make a tree. Who knows what you might make as you form it out of clay. And then you can smish it back down and start to make it over again. And if it's Play-Doh, when you're done, you take it and smish it. Maybe I always separated out the colors. I know not everybody does, but I always had to have the colors separated back out. Separate out the colors, put it in the right containers, and seal the containers so the clay would last just as long as it could. When I was a kid, I also had Lego blocks. Any of you have Lego blocks? So I used to put together things with Lego blocks. Um, I would make creatures, I would make vehicles, and mostly I loved to make buildings. I used to want to be an architect when I was a kid, so I would make different houses and different churches and different schools and different structures and make up a story for how that structure was used. And it was, when it was left over, I would take it all apart and put away the bricks, except for the few that got left on the floor accidentally and my father stepped on them barefoot and then I learned to put my bricks away even better. Sometimes we make things and sometimes we remake things. My sister was a little different in that. My sister um, has always been a pretty serious artist. And so sometimes she would make a painting and work really hard painting it. And then when she was finished, she might decide something wasn't quite right. And so maybe she would take some paint and cover up part of the picture she didn't think was right and remake that to make it work the right way. So how things turn out the first time isn't necessarily how they turn out the last time. I know bakers and cooks who make and remake dishes all the time. Some of them I've been in your home and eaten um, dishes that you have made and so you try it, and it might not work this time. You try it, it might work that time. You try something different this time, and maybe it's great, or maybe it isn't. We keep trying and trying, trying to do the best we can do. Well, in the scripture that will get read later today by Bob um, is a scripture written to the church in Ephesus, an ancient city in the country we now call Turkey, in the olden days it was called um, Asia, uh, very near the big city called Izmir. I've been there, I'll talk about that in my sermon. In this letter, the writer is encouraging Christian people to remake themselves, to try to become better people than they have been and learn how to live in ways that makes them imitators of who Jesus is. The whole idea being that if you follow Jesus, if you've been baptized, if you've confirmed your faith, if you call yourself a Christian, that in fact it should make some difference in who you are as a person. And so things about you should change. And they're very specific things that get named in the scripture that get called for to change. Um, put away falsehood, that means stop telling any sort of lies. Um, you can be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't sin. So um, when you get angry, don't let your anger make you do hateful things. Um, it called on Christians to give up stealing. Oh my goodness, that implies that some of them were stealing before they were told to do that. Um, but stealing is not good. If you're a follower of Jesus, you shouldn't steal. And in fact, 
a portion of everything you have, you earn it in order to give it to people in need. Um, don't let evil talk come out of your mouths. Don't say mean things. Don't say hateful things. Don't say hurtful things. Well, that's just some of the things that will be on the list that will get read later in the service. What I wanted to talk to you about, though, was this very idea that we try to make of ourselves or let God make of ourselves something new. We try to become more and more like the loving people God wants us to be and more and more able to walk in the ways of Jesus so that we can be faithful and loving and by our very lives demonstrate the one we follow. Please pray with me. Dear God, Make us after Christ's image. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. We come now to our time of prayer together. Please pray with me. Our gracious and loving God, how grateful we are that on this day and in this moment and on every day and at any moment, we can sense your presence as we gather together in Christ's name. By your Spirit's power, we ask you to stir among us a sense of your presence. And by my efforts to speak the word and your gifts of knowledge to each and everyone who hears, we pray that we will come better to know you and your will for us and for the world and to live our lives in ways that we make your love and mercy known in all we say and do. Help us to be faithful and also hopeful. Help us to live in ways that proclaim good news. As we gather, we bring with us all of our lives and our joys and concerns come with us as well. We are aware of people who are sick, people who are recovering from surgery, people who are facing surgery, people who are in the midst of long-term treatments, people who are 
um, living with um, disabilities or um, uh, uh, difficult to manage medical conditions. We pray also for people living with any form of mental illness, um, emotional illness, all the different ways we can be unwell of body or mind or spirit. We lift these to you, gracious God, and ask your blessing. We ask for healing that comes through faith and hope. We ask for healing that comes from love shared in community. We ask for healing that comes from doctors and nurses and physicians' assistants and therapies and all the different uh, medications and um, programs that help us to find wellness. We pray that you would help us to be a part of your work of healing in this day in our community of faith, and in the world around us. We are aware, too, of people living with mental illness, I, um, people living with addictions, pardon me, people who are um, living with substance use disorders of one form or another, and we pray for their blessing and for the capacity to seek sobriety. Yes, for the long haul, but more for the present moment calling upon you, calling upon the steps, calling upon any ways that can help them to find strength and hope in the moment that can make the day a brighter day. In this day, we honor many who have served our country and those who seek still to serve our country, aware of one this very day in our presence who goes off to begin training. Um, God, we are grateful for faithful women and men who have served you and this country with honor and with dignity and distinction. And we are aware, too, that there have been those who have not made it home. And there have been those whose lives have been lost in service of our country and all that we stand for. As we worship you this day, we give thanks for love and mercy that holds all your children now and forever and for the opportunity we have to remember and to honor people whose service is great. And we pray for this church, grateful for its presence in our community and in our lives, grateful for the ways we love one another and our friends and family together and for the ways you call us to serve both within our congregation and in the world around us, we ask your blessings in all our efforts that we could live up to your calling to follow Christ and serve him and all your children. Now we take a moment to offer silent prayers. Hear now the prayers we offer in our hearts. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we take a moment to offer our tithes and gifts to God. We will not have ushers pass the offering plates in this service, um, but we know that people offer their gifts in many ways, perhaps electronically, perhaps mailing in a check, and there are always people who bring an offering and place it in the offering plate that is um, located conveniently um, by the organ as you walk in and out of the room. There is now posted on the page a uh, listing to our church website where people watching remotely can offer their gifts as well. The important thing is that we recognize God has blessed us in many ways and given us in such abundance that we are capable, to take, capable of taking part of what we have 
and offering it back for God's own good purpose. Let us receive the morning offering. Scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25 to chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which you were marked with, a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be imitations of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. May the living word of God speak to us through these ancient words of scripture. I don't know if all Marines read scripture like that, but I appreciate the way this Marine reads scripture um, with confidence and a projection of his faith. So the scripture, the sermon title is Faithful imitation. But I want to start just a little information about um, the letter to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. It's called Paul's letter to um, the Ephesians. And that's the place where I need to start with my argument against it. I don't think that that's the name. I don't think that's the case. I don't think Paul wrote this letter. We know that Paul went to Ephesus in the uh, book of Acts. Paul go, the 19th and 20th chapter, Paul goes to Ephesus as part of his journey. Ephesus is located on the Mediterranean in what now is Turkey. It would have been um, the capital 
of the Roman province of Asia. It's, uh, it was on the shore then. I've been there. I've been to Ephesus. It's now uh, quite a ways in from shore, just the way um, coastlines shift over the centuries. And when Paul was there, he was there for some time. It, the, the story in um, the book of Acts start with his meeting some Christians, and when he talks to them, he finds out they've not received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, well, um, who baptized you? And they say, John, meaning John the Baptist, who baptized them for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And Paul says, oh, no, 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 no. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And so he baptized them again, and it says they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, interpreted in that um, letter, uh, that book, um, Book of Acts, as they're speaking in tongues. And then he goes to the synagogue, and he preaches for some months there. And at one point when he is um, on the Merchant Street, I, I'm pausing because I can see it in my brain, the place where the merchants were, and particularly the merchants that sold like... Uh, silver idols to the different gods of the time, and in particular in Ephesus, the god of the city was Artemis. Um, and so when he was there, he was um, observed doing his preaching, and one of the artisans got upset saying, if this man has his way, we're going to lose our income. He's going to take away our understanding of the God who is the God of this city. We don't want to be destitute. And so it caused an uproar in the city. Um, and so much so it, it talks about a riot in the book of um, Acts. And so they end up all going to the theater, which I have been to also. Um, in fact, my friends and I sat down at the edge of that theater and read the passage from um, the book of Acts to recreate that story as there was a trial put on about whether or not um, Christians should be allowed to preach their gospel in the community. Um, it is a remarkable story. So you would think our knowing that uh, Paul was in fact in um, Ephesus that he could have written Ephesians it's called, now called Ephes, E-F-E-S, is now it's in the modern day, the ruins. Um, but when you read this letter, it's pretty distinct from what Paul's theology was. You've heard me talk about, with Paul, a, a, an important part of his theology is the already and the not yet. Already we have been saved in Christ, but we are not yet fully what we will become. Already we live with the sense of God's heaven, but it has not yet been established on earth. It's very important to Paul that the life of the faithful Christian is lived in this kind of almost tense, but this between time state of having received the gift of salvation, but the realm of heaven has not yet been established. And that creates then some of the energy for trying to help spread the gospel in the world, this sense that the heavenly realm is coming. Good news still is reaching out to bring change and transformation. Well, the letter to the Ephesians, it's pretty clear. It has what's called realized eschatology. <laughs> Isn't that a term? I know you were looking for a good term to take home today. You can talk about that over dinner with a friend or maybe with your spouse or whatever. Realized eschatology, it's, a great, it's great at a party. This is a great term. Um, for the writer of this letter, all of the realities of salvation are accomplished. And so therefore, we should be new people. Um, it's not that Paul didn't want us to be new people. Paul had a great recognition of how we were evolving and moving forward. But the, the writer of Ephesians um, seems to see it all very much as accomplished. And it it's as, fact, it's as if part of what this author's intention to do is to get us all to understand that so that we can live with this new reality as a part of our comprehension and a part of how we live. Well, I want to go back to um, Ephesus for a minute. Although, actually, I don't want to go um, to Ephesus. I want to go to a hill next to Ephesus. So Ephesus was this great city. It was the capital of the Roman um, uh, province of Asia, and it was a port city, um, but it was prone to earthquakes. 
And after enough earthquakes that had devastated the city, uh, they abandoned it and moved elsewhere. And so some of the areas around um, Ephesus, there are structures that have been built out of the rubble from the destroyed city. And so one such structure is on a hill just a little bit away from Ephesus, and it's where the Basilica of John um, the Basilica of John was built, a Christian church. I believe it is John the Gospel writer, not John the Baptist. The legend of that um, church is that it was built over the place where John was buried. Uh, of course, the challenge in Turkey and all these ancient archaeological sites is that Turkey has since, many centuries ago, but since has become a Muslim nation and so some of the old Christian sites have been turned into um, mosques. This one had not, um, but again, it was destroyed in an earthquake. And so we went to see this and some of the reconstruction they've tried to do in the parts that were there. But all of this story was so that I could tell you about our experience of walking into the baptistry. So the baptistry, the place where people were baptized into the Christian faith. It also could be called a font, but unlike our font, which is the marble um, pillar um, over in the corner of our church that we pull out when we have a baptism, or the real historic font for us as a congregation, the pewter baptismal bowl that is inside that marble pillar, I can see it from where I'm standing now, um, this baptismal font was large. In fact, I was trying to decide, I think it's about the width of the apse here, or chancel, to use a liturgical term, and in the middle, about the width of the top of the stairs, that platform there, um, I think it was about that size, maybe a little bigger, was an octagonal hole in the ground. So it was the top of it was just on ground level. And then there was that octagonal hole. And on either side were like five, six deep steps. So there was steps coming in, then the baptistry right there. And it was just all on ground level. And so the tour guide told us this is where the baptisms happened. Well, we, most of us were Christian ministers. And so we had an understanding of what baptism was like in the ancient world. So in that time, when it, was, uh, when it was ready for the moment of baptism to take place, it usually would happen on Easter morning at the dawn of the sun. And so there was the great Easter vigil. So the night before, all the people that have been um, uh, studying and learning and deciding to become Christian and ready to confess and join the church would keep a vigil all night long. And as part of that vigil, standing on one side of the baptistry, and, in, and I'm on that correct side right now, it would be on the west side, one of the last things they did before baptism was to face the west and quite literally say goodbye to their old way of life. Goodbye to the things they had done that were in opposition to Christianity. Say goodbye to the things that they, they had done that were um, signs of self-reliance. Say goodbye to their sinful ways. Say goodbye to the people who would not join them in this journey. And then when it was time for baptism, they would turn to the east. And they would walk down one by one into the pool of the baptismal font and be baptized in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They would confess their faith in Christ and walk out on the other side and be clothed in a white robe. I didn't mention that you leave your old clothes behind too. Clothed in a white robe and enter into the Christian faith and the Christian community. We thought about that as we stood there. In fact, we ended up being a little sacrilegious, not all of us. One of my friends, an Episcopalian priest, would not cooperate in this, but all of us, no, we kept our clothes on, but we all got down into the font and gave the tour guide a camera and said, take our picture. So we were all in the font at one time, and um, this one colleague and friend of mine said, this is not right, that's a baptistry. But for us, it was a historic relic, and we wanted to be in it, and um, I cherish that picture. I was looking for it on my phone before worship, but it's not on my phone. I have to figure out where that picture is. I think about that place on a hilltop very close 
to where the Christian congregation would have been to whom this letter was addressed, probably by a disciple of Paul, somebody he had taught, um, as this writer encouraged the Christian people to turn away from anything that was unchristlike and live their lives as imitators of Jesus. So put away falsehood and speak truth to one another. You know, that's not always easy, right? It, it's hard sometimes to speak the truth. And I have, I have a friend who one time, she would only speak the truth. So if somebody stopped her, I'm going to say her name was Louise. It was not, hey, Louise, how are you doing? She would tell you how she was doing. She would tell you what was hurting. She would tell you what had gone wrong. She would tell you all of her disappointments. She absolutely had no filters, but she was being honest. She might well have been uh, literally living out this passage. Put away falsehood. Be angry, but don't sin. It acknowledges that anger is a part of who we are, but we don't have to have our anger motivate us to being hurtful or harmful. Be angry, don't sin. Give up stealing, um, which I joked about that earlier, but in fact, um, any sort of dishonest activity or activity that takes advantage of or takes away from others, that's not part of the Christian way of being. And it even adds whatever you do, part of your motivation is to have resources to share with people in need. So not only do you not take advantage of other people, but you use what you have to help and to serve other people. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. You could put gossip in that category, but there are other things as well. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I forgot there was another, there was another, I, I did some study on that word in the Greek and I have forgotten what the other thing was. Um, so it, it implied not grieving the Holy Spirit, but maybe even being jealous of the Holy Spirit. In other words, in other words recognize different ones of us will be gifted in different ways. Different ones of us will be led in different ways. It's not our job uh, to be upset about how someone else is guided or even how we are guided. Trust and follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. And that talks about our having been sealed um, with a seal for the day of redemption. That our baptism, our entry into the mark of the church is a sign and a promise that we are held in God's love and care for all eternity. One of the things I proclaimed at the funeral that was here on Friday was that God's blessings and God's love held um, Nancy all of the days of her life and that she now lives in God's very presence. And though we as faithful people grieve those we have lost and um, difficulties of the past and tragedies that have happened in our lives and in the world around us, we place our trust that somehow God brings good and nothing ever can separate us from God's love. The writer of the letter to the church in Ephesus inspired us, encouraged us, implored us to put behind us all the things that keep us from living after the example of Jesus and to seek instead to be faithful and loving people who do God's own work in all we say and do. And that's an imitation I'm willing to aspire for, and I hope you are too. Please pray with me. Our gracious and loving God, we are grateful that in compassion you hold and love us all our days, and that you make, up, make it possible by your Spirit's blessing for us to become something new as we seek to live after the example of Jesus. Help us truly to turn our eyes toward him and to live all our days in ways that seek to make love known both within our own lives and in the world around us. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.
Now the benediction. Go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, trusting God's love to make you anew after Christ's example day by day. Amen.